Good morning. Thank you for being here on time. It's so good to see so many faces. Uh, Mr. Parento and the tech team, as you know, we've been hosting our tech talks. This is the fifth of six tech, talk, tech talks. And we're so fortunate to have Mr. Hans Bellamoria here. He is from the Grassroot Trust, an organization in Sri Lanka that focuses on rights advocacy, health education, and also cyber violation and how to be safe online. And uh, we're really fortunate to have you here because he's somewhat of a guru and um, we really believe it's a team effort home and school to keep our kids safe online. So let's give a round welcome, round warm applause to Mr. Uh, thank you. So since we have just over an hour, I'm about to condense a lot of information, not too much, but enough for us to go home and start thinking about a few things. Now, the reason that we are in this business of cyber exploitation is very simply because of the violence that happens online. So my organization works in the field of gender-based violence. And we have found that when we talk about gender-based violence and the different manifestations of gender-based violence, sometimes the violence that happens online isn't always covered as it should be. Now, because we also work in the field of sexual violence, uh, we see basically how we treat people offline percolating onto how we treat people online. I think we all know that instinctively, we know that that is happening. So before we even discuss tech, uh, I'd like to point towards six core values uh, that we at the Grassroots Trust are trying to push through all schools. And what we do is when we have a program with kids, for example, we go in and we don't so much talk about what happens online before we talk about these six core values. And the reason we've identified these six core values is simply because they apply when your kids are online or even when we are online. So for example, being sensible. We talk a lot about being sensible about showing good judgment, about thinking through the consequences of one's actions, thinking about before they send that text or write that message, or for that matter, take that picture and send it across. What would be the consequences of that? What would be the consequences of that when you have a culture here in Sri Lanka that is sort of mixed in terms of you have Miley Cyrus and Free the Nipple and you have uh, the Kardashian girls who take nudes. You have that on one side and then on the other side you have the shame that is applied to the nude image in Sri Lanka. So what, how do we balance that out? What, what's going on there? And how do we make kids understand that? That yes, it's okay, you need to be proud, you need this is your body and it's your right. If you want to send the nude, send the nude. We are not telling anyone don't send nudes. We're not being that prescriptive, we're not being that judgmental, but what are the consequences? What are the conditions under which you do that? What are the conditions under which you think you are doing that? Because most often, that initial nude is exchanged because of what they feel is expected of a relationship, what they feel is a symbol of love and trust. Love and trust is the, is the driver, if you like, for the exchange of nudes in Sri Lanka, or probably globally. I love him. I trust him, I trust her, I love her. And then how that is used. I love you, don't you trust me? Do you think I will do something like that? So we need our kids to understand this. And part of that is understanding respect. Now, in Sri Lanka, when I talk about respect, I always go and ask kids, what is respect? And uniformly, they all kind of scratch their heads and this. There's no, real, there's no real definition that comes forth. They're scratching their heads and they're wondering, what is respect? What is respect? And then I say, okay, I'll make it easier for you. Whom should we respect? Parents, teachers, clergy, and the list starts, country, flag, you know? And I have found that respect, often it goes outward and it goes upward. It, that self-respect, the respect that turns in, or understanding respect as valuing yourself or valuing another person, that seems to be empty. So I was at a girl's school yesterday and I walked in and everybody stood up. I said, good morning, and they sat down. 
And then I turned around and I said something and they stood up again. I said, sit down. And then I said, and we had this discussion around respect, what is respect? And they started giving us these outward trappings of respect. Not understanding what respect even means. I said, who here has not heard the word respect in the last 24 hours? And the girls got up and said, sir, respect was there in our prayers this morning. So, okay, what does it mean? No, no idea. So as parents, we encourage you to have a discussion on helping your kids understand what respect actually means and the value of self-respect. And why the value of self-respect? Because here's the thing, connected with self-esteem. Here's what the boys tell me, sir, you want to get a nude? Here's what you do. You tell the girls who think they're not beautiful that they're beautiful. You tell the girls who think they're not pretty that they're pretty. You appreciate them. Because when you start appreciating them and telling them they're beautiful and telling them they look good and telling them that they have nice legs and saying that you look hot and saying all these things to the girls, especially the girls with low self-esteem, sir, easy targets, we can get nudes. So this discussion on self-esteem, self-respect is crucial and I always tell teachers if you use words like stupid, if you use words like idiot, if you use words like a fool, if you use words that bring down someone's self-esteem, you probably give up teaching and go home. Okay? Uh, and it's the same to parents. How do we talk to our children? What are we doing to build their self-esteem? In a realistic way, I'm not saying you are the best at everything, you are going to win the 100 meters at the Olympics. That's not what I'm talking about. How do we make sure our children value themselves? And how do we make sure our children support each other in a world where self-esteem is always being eroded? What do we do there? Because self-esteem being eroded, sometimes the kids contribute to that, right? We know the words. Kids can be mean. What do they type? What is that text? What is that WhatsApp group? Have you heard of this? We are the WhatsApp group. We have six really good friends. And then there's another WhatsApp group of the five other friends. Who they talk about the sixth friend. Right? I think, I don't know if you have groups like that. <laughs> okay? And then the mean things that are said. The comments that are made about body, about how they dress how they wear their hair, how they walk, how they talk, who they are with. And that's, that's, that's universal, that's, that's not limited to Sri Lanka. But what are we doing to have conversations with our children about that? Then empathy. I have found that in general there is a very poor understanding of what empathy is. Um, so for example, what I do is I get the kids to come take off their shoes, take another person's shoes off and then exchange shoes and start walking around and trying to understand what it means to walk in another person's shoes. And then when you ask them for definitions, they struggle. So I, I break it down for them very simply and I say, listen, sympathy, empathy, it's very simple. Sympathy is I feel sorry for your pain. Empathy is I feel your pain. Okay, and I start getting them to understand understand and have those discussions and think of examples from their own life and the lack of empathy ladies and gentlemen is crucial to cyber exploitation so it's not just the exchanging of news the sharing of news the selling of news we'll get to that i'm fascinated by the parents who on whatsapp groups have sent news of other children on that group and say, look at this child, see what she has done. Look at how she has brought shame to her family. Or that basic manner. And that fascinates me because those parents are no different from the perpetrators. Those parents are perpetrators. Because the more these images get and these videos get circulated, the more options there are for the organizer to collect them. Because basically, ladies and gentlemen, what we need to understand is that our children included are providing free content for pornography developers. You have to understand that. This nude culture where you're exchanging nudes and you're exchanging videos or you're making videos, someone picked it. I don't need to pay for porn to be made anymore. I have content providers 
and those content providers are in schools. And that is why empathy is so important. Because you have organizers contacting boys in schools to generate content for them. You have organizers giving boys in schools multiple mobile phones, smart mobile phones, which they go and then offer girls in schools, girls who don't have those phones. And say, here is a brand new phone for you, you don't have a phone. But all you need to do now is send me a picture a week. That's all you need to do. You don't even need to put your face on it. Just a picture a week. Trust. Now I know trust is easy. Trust is faith. Trust is to believe in someone. Trust. Surely our kids know about trust, but do they? Girl on this side of the rugby field. Boy on that side of the rugby field. They see each other. Girl asks friend, who is that? Oh, that's this boy. I have his number. Let's chat. Start chatting. Three months later, she sends him an upper body nude. Fine. And then I ask, okay, did he force you? Did he? How? How did it happen? Just explain to me. No, sir, we were in a relationship. We fell in love. We used to talk every day. And during the discussion, it transpired she has never met this boy. So for three months, they've been having this discussion online. She's fallen in love, or she thinks she's fallen in love, and she sent this nude to this boy, unsolicited, apparently. And why? Because she trusted him. What does trust mean? Whom do our kids trust? That's a conversation we need to have. Because we always tell the kids, you need to go to a trusted adult, you need to go to the counselor, you need to go to your parents, you need... Who is this trusted adult? Have we helped our children understand who the trusted adults are in their lives? Who are these people? In the event you are not around, in the event they can't come to you, who are these people? Who do they go to? And do you have an open line of communication with your child where your child feels that he or she can come to you without judgment? In Sri Lanka, we have handled three cases of sexual violence with the use of a nude solely because of the relationship between parent and child. What do I mean? What I mean is the girl sends a photograph to the boy. The boy says, right now I have your photograph. You've got to have sex with me. The girl says, no, I don't want to have sex. Yes, you will have sex with me. If you don't have sex with me, this image goes to your father. And that fear of the image going to the father, three instances in the last two years, where that girl has then ended up being raped, essentially, with this image being held over her because of the relationship between father and child. Now, we obviously encourage open lines of communication where your child can come and say to you, listen, dad, listen, mom, I made a mistake. This happened to me. Now I'm being blackmailed. Now I'm being extorted. In Kalutara, in a school, the parents came home. Their cupboard had been broken into and the mother's jewelry was all missing. They took the domestic worker to the police station because it must have been her, right? The daughter then comes and confesses, no, it was me. I sent my nude to the, my boyfriend. He now wants me to pay him 75,000 rupees or he was going to send it to you. So I took your jewelry and I pawned it and I gave him 75,000 rupees. What is that relationship? What is that fear? So, trust is a conversation that we really must have and then of course consent. Especially in Sri Lanka where consent, there is no discussion on consent. There is absolutely no discussion on consent. We do not teach our girls or our boys anything to do with what consent means. What we teach our boys and our girls, single keyword illankana, English keyword asking for it. The girl is asking for it. He or she is asking for it. By the way she dresses, by the way she looks, by the way she walks, by the what she does, maybe she has a drink, maybe she had a cigarette, maybe she goes out at night. She's asking for it. She's asking for it. We are teaching our kids about this asking for it culture and then take a look at public transport. Public transport in Sri Lanka, trains and buses, over 90% of girls over the age of 14 up to women the age of 40 have faced sexual harassment on public transport. And when you speak to the victims,
They stand there and the boys come in and it's a rite of passage in some boys schools, it's a rite of passage. It's a rite of passage to get on that bus and harass that girl or get on that bus and rub yourself up against that girl. Which means, what? You've not rubbed yourself up against the girl? What's wrong with you? Are you a man? So that is where we are. And in that culture, where consent is not at all understood, sir, if she doesn't like it, she should have moved forward. She just stood there. If she stood there, that means she likes it. It's a crowded bus. It's 2 o'clock in the afternoon. She can't move forward. And if you ask the victim, sir, I don't want to move. I can't move. I have to get down the next halt. If I go forward, then he comes forward. There's no point in moving. So we just take it. I can't tell you how many women we have spoken to across this country, girls and women, who say they just sit there and take it. Take it. Because the next day they got to get on that bus and go because they can't afford to get the car, they can't afford to go by three wheeler, they can't afford to take an Uber. Because that is also the comment. If you can't go on the bus during this time, take a three wheeler, buy a car. Consent. Our kids do not understand consent and we have to help them understand consent. Next slide. So, let's get a bit into where Sri Lanka is. Now this is 2017 data because the 2018 data is not out yet. So if you take a look at internet penetration, how many users there were in Sri Lanka in 2010, there was 12%. Okay, I'm guessing that all of you here, if you were here in 2010, you make up that 12%. Now from 12% in 2016, we were at 22%. So over a six year period, we jumped by 10%. And then again by 2017, we jumped to 32%. So six years for 10% and then in a year, another 10%. And TRC predicts that we would be now well over 40% from 2018 onwards. Now what is the reason for that marked improvement, that jump of 10% in a year where it took six years? Next slide. If you take a look at the last box here, if you take a look at the last box here, you will see that the number one instrument or device that is used to connect the internet is the smart mobile phone. The smart mobile phone in terms of it being a computer has changed the game in terms of how people connect with the internet. We've seen it. And if you take a look at it, I'm, I feel sorry for those who went into the internet cafe business, right? Because over the years, if you took a look at the internet cafe business, it has deteriorated rapidly and I'm talking outside of Kalango, I'm talking about in every village, every town, there are internet cafes and you don't have internet cafes anymore. In the old days, the parents, when I'm saying old days, three, four years ago, the parents used to come and say, talk to our children, talk to our boys because they're in that cafe, they're in that cave and they're all surrounded this computer. But now, they're all surrounding that phone and looking at that phone, what is on that phone, when we ask them what they're looking at, they say they're watching a game, they're watching a cricket match. So, you can see smartphones are changing and a smartphone brand new is 3,500 rupees. So, then you've got to look at second hand value because that is your entry point. So, your entry point to having a computer and being online is about 2,000 rupees. Now, it's, they say 40% but wherever I've gone, whichever group of young people I have been with, even in the middle of the Vanni in Bogas weather, there are smartphones. So, this accessibility in terms of cost has really changed how we connect with the internet and that is a good thing. Right? That is a good thing. That means more people have access to information. But when I was in Bogaswaga, for example, and I asked the parents, what do you tell your children about the internet? How do you explain the internet to them? This is what they say. I say it in Sinhala. So basically, the teachers and the parents, all they talk about in relation to the internet is porn. So they tell their kids, don't watch porn, there is porn, this porn is like this, porn is like that. And they have this huge discussion on porn and they were having it with me. And then I went to the kids. I said, okay, guys, what do you guys look at online? It was a group of 16, eight boys, eight girls. 
all of them look down. And I tried different ways to get them to talk. Are you Googling, YouTube? Nothing. So I decided, okay, I moved the girls to a colleague of mine and I took the boys outside and we had a discussion. And we started talking about how do you get online. And then it transpired that because of the limitation of devices, they don't get too much time if they borrow the brother's phone or the sister's phone or if the friend has the phone. Not too much time. So half an hour for a day, maybe two days, three days, only half an hour. So I said, what do you watch? Heads down. And then they were like, sir, you know what, what we watch? I said, no, I don't know what you watch. So that not. Abhi ewa balana. We watch that. What is that? Porn. Right? So is it any wonder that Sri Lanka 2014, 2015, 2016? 2011, 12, 13, 14, number one in the world, Googling sex. 2015, we lost our crown. 2016, we got it back, Googling sex. 2017, we were number five. 2018, just now finished, we were number three. So we're maintaining our rate. And we're not Googling sex. Because if you check the stats, we're Googling sex video and video sex. And guess what? Asabhya videos translate as video sex. Right? So we are pushing our children or we are giving them an understanding that pornography and the internet is kind of synonymous and that's incredibly dangerous. Add to that, of course, let's not even talk about the standard of sex education in Sri Lanka. So if you take a look at first access on average, you can see it's about the same. Girls are a little later than the boys, and this is this is our national average. Uh, you can take a look at the urban, the rural, and also the plantation sector. It's very interesting in Sri Lanka. We have urban, rural, plantation because we try to make sure that the plantation is a completely different subspecies. They are not they are not rural. They are not urban. They are subspecies. Because if you start adding plantation data in terms of alcoholism, in terms of incest, etc., or in terms of sexual abuse, then our national averages really skyrocket. So if you take a look at some of our Sri Lankan reports, the plantation sector is often left out because it inflates numbers. Just as a comment. That's development for you. Um, so here we are, okay, and you can see that 13, around 13, 14 is your entry point here. Now I'm guessing your kids possibly started earlier. Right? Am I wrong? Is there anybody here whose kids started at 13 connecting with the internet? Yeah. So the conversations we have with our children, let's go back to those six values. No harm starting young. You don't have to wait until they're 13, 14, 15 or until they're sort of sexually aware. You don't have to wait. Have those conversations early, in an age-appropriate manner. Next slide. So if you take a look at time spent online, okay, those are your statistics. You talk to the kids. Now yesterday at that school I said, how many of you here have not been online in the last 24 hours? No hands went up. Right? One, one hand did, sorry, one hand did go up. I said, WhatsApp Fiber is also online. Hand went down. <laughs> okay? Everybody's on WhatsApp. Because you talk with kids, who has your own device? Yesterday, about 40%. Who has WhatsApp? 90%. So, own device, 40%. WhatsApp, 90%. Why? Because you're using your mother's phone, right? You're using your dad's phone. Next slide. And if you take a look at the most commonly visited online social media sites, this is your... This is your graph. Facebook, number one, but not in Colombo. I don't know about your kids. Are your kids on Facebook? Guess why? Are you on Facebook? Yeah. Just the same thing. Who has Facebook? Two kids. Whose parents have Facebook? All hands went up. So you don't like Facebook? No, sir. Who wants to be monitored? <laughs> My mother tried to get on Instagram. I told her, here, you don't get on Instagram. Instagram is for me. You have Facebook. No, why, why Instagram? No, you, you can share pictures on Facebook. No, why do you want to get on Instagram? Right? 
So Instagram, Facebook is high also because while Instagram, Snapchat, all that, that's pretty, uh, that's pretty Colombo urban, not even outside of Colombo. It's pretty Colombo urban, maybe Candy Gold, maybe the big cities have Instagram. But when it comes to Facebook, everybody's got Facebook. But here's the thing, Facebook's got a bad rap. Because in Sri Lanka, often you hear this, Facebook is the problem, we have to ban Facebook. Mahindra Rajapaksa said it a few years ago. You have to ban Facebook, Facebook is bad. So I'm in Batiklo talking to kids and I said, who's on Facebook? No one's on Facebook. And then my colleague made some jokes, very current on Facebook, and everybody laughed. And I said, how are you laughing at these jokes if you are not on Facebook? No sir, we are not on Facebook by our name. <laughs> because it's not good, no sir, to be on Facebook. And if our parents know that we are on Facebook, it's a problem, sir. So we are on Facebook, but not with our name. But everybody knows it's everyone's suit on it. Right? So they're still, they're still talking, they're still doing everything because they know who you are. So Latoya, yes, I'm, I'm friends with Latoya and Toyala, you know what I mean? Toyala and Latoya, no problem because they know who Latoya and Toyala are. Next slide. So, if you take a look at why, okay, Sri Lankan youth, one to five hours, just do a quick check. How long your kids are online? Just do a quick check. Do you have uh, internet free zones in your home? Where you got to check your device at the gate, like, like you, before going to a church, you leave your gun outside. <laughs> Might be an idea. Might be an idea to have an internet free zone in the house or even an internet free time in the house. Like between this time and this time, no devices and that goes for you too. You got to lead by example. You got to have, did you know why? Because everybody is online all the time, right? All the time, everybody is online, online, online. I mean, that's my phone. There's a reason. There's a reason I have this phone. <laughs> Is there anyone in this room who has a phone like mine? Only a phone like mine? I'm not saying a phone like this and then a smartphone too. <laughs> Only a phone like this. Anybody in this room? Right? Now the reason I have this phone is because I like switching off. I like when I'm traveling to Kilinochi to travel to Kilinochi and not be in New York. Right? That's the reason. Now, I'm not advocating that for you, but I am saying we need to help our kids take a step back in terms of being online. And we need to help them do that to understand that there are other things to do than being online. And when I'm saying being online, I don't just mean social media. There was a kid we interviewed in Batiklo who for 16 hours, every Saturday and Sunday, because he's not allowed any other day, is online playing games. 16 hours. So he sleeps, gets up, eats, does everything in front of the computer because he has made that deal with the parents. I will study during those five days, but the weekend is mine. He's about 17. 16 hours a day on average, and he says, so it's actually more. Okay? Now, what do we use the internet mostly for? Please note, that maintaining relationships now outstrips getting information. Do you remember when the internet was about getting information? Where if you don't know something, you'd go and ask Jeeves. You remember that? Right? It was about getting information. And then Google came. It was about getting information. We don't know something, let's find out. That's why no one can bullshit anymore. Right? You had a party, someone bullshits you, Google it. That's not right. Okay, good. It keeps me, shuts people up. If you don't know what you're talking about, don't talk about it. Begins time, you know what I mean? Shuts people up. Now, the point is, look at what has outstripped it. Maintaining relationships, and I think that's an oxymoron. Right? And the reason I think that's a kind of oxymoron is because those memes you see at coffee shops of everybody sitting around a table and looking at their phones, you know why those are funny? Because they are true. They are true, just observe it, just, 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 just try, just go to a coffee shop, go to whatever coffee shop you go to and just check out how many people are actually on their device. How many people are spending time here? What about the fact that we, in the old days we used to watch TV together? TV, watching TV was a family thing. Now, TV is on, iPad is on, phone is on. Other phone is on, 
TV program is on. I'm watching it, but I'm also watching YouTube. TV program, I'm watching it, but I'm on my email. TV program is that I'm watching it, but I'm answering WhatsApp. Right? So, maintaining relationships, you know, is there anyone here who gets a text from your child or from your partner or someone in your house when you are in the house? You think that doesn't happen? It happens. It happens. Because they can't be bothered. In the old days, you just shout, right? Mary! Mary, come here. <laughs> Next slide. So if you take a look at the top websites visited, uh, Facebook at the top, for reasons I said, the most popular social media site in Sri Lanka. I'd like you to drop your eyes to number 20. Number 20 is a porn site. Now these porn sites have become crucial to our conversation in the last year. Because initially, what was happening was that the value of the nude or the value of the video was based on knowledge of who was in the nude and who was in the video. That was where the value was. So if it was a girl from, let's say, British school, and everybody knew who this girl was, that video or that image would have more currency. It's someone we know. Because it's not just about an naked image. You can download Jennifer Lawrence. It's not just about an naked image. So initially that value was about how we know these girls. So for example, we entered into the business when we received a tip from a girl and then that transpired to be a ring that was taking place where databases were being maintained with the kids' names, the schools that they go to, and a description of the picture, front, top, back, bottom, like that, categorized. And those lists were being sent to boys, saying, if you have a picture or a video of your girlfriend, send them to us and we will give you access to this database. They were targeting boys who had broken up. You have broken up with so-and-so, if you have a video or a picture send them to us and we will give you access to this database and remember it was the boy who broke up that first started to share. Remember the term revenge porn? The reason we use cyber exploitation and violence is because Kamala Harris who is now running for president in the US, she came up with the term cyber exploitation when she was attorney general of California in 2015. She said this is not pornography, this is exploitation. And that's the thing, the kind of divide between pornography and exploitation now is very blurred. And with this homemade porn industry that is burgeoning, it is very blurred. So a site like Xhamster would run a video that has been made by your kids of them having sex. But the good thing about Xhamster, Pornhub, all the big sites, if you contact them and say, listen, this video, this picture, it is me and it has been put up without my consent, they take it down. Next. So if you take a look at the complaints that have been made, you will see that social media related complaints are at the top. Right? Next slide. And you will see they have been kind of steadily growing. But this is only CERT data, Computer Emergency Readiness Team, every country has one. This is only CERT data. The CID Cybercrime Division gets about 300 cases a week. Then this does not include cases that we get, that women in need get, and other organizations working in the field. Basically, a coordinated response here is proving difficult, and I'll get to that. Next slide. So if we break that down, you can see fake social media accounts and hacking. Now this hacking is relevant as of two days ago to us, even more so. So here's what happened. Here's what you need to do rather. Go home and tell your kids and you must do this too. If you get a link from someone you don't know or you're not sure of, please don't click on that. Because here's what happens. When you click on that link, it may take you to some innocuous website. But it has also given that person opportunity to get into your phone or to get into your device. And here's what happened three days ago, two days ago. 
This boy accepted a link and he took him to some website. He thought no more about it. Then he was watching some pornography and he was masturbating to that pornography, not realizing that his camera was turned on and he was being recorded doing that. Then that video of him masturbating was sent to him and he was asked to pay 80,000 rupees if he didn't want that video to go out. So when that matter was investigated, the people who were doing the cyber forensics identified that this has happened due to this link and that this is now possible. At least that was news to me. They knew about it. Okay. So this is something that we really need to think about and really have a conversation with our kids about. And also, our focus, as I have pointed out, is those incidents of photo abuse and also incidents related to pornography. Right. So being sensible. Next. Next slide. So these are the kinds of motivations that we have identified over the years for why this happens. Like I said right at the start, love and trust right up there. Okay. The relationship, the symbol of trust, the symbol of fidelity, that is what this photograph has become. Then just sex and masturbation. Sir, this is the way for us to have sex. We are not allowed to have sex. This is the way for us to have sex. We have online sex. What's the problem? Okay. Uh, curiosity. Sir, I just wanted to see what my girlfriend looks like. Sir, I just wanted to see what my boyfriend looks like. Curiosity. Distance. Okay. Girl is in Candy. Boy is in Colombo. Husband is in Busan, Korea. Wife is in Mayangara. They have a Skype call and they are sexually active on that Skype call and they do that on a regular basis until the hostel mates of the guy in Busan figured out that it's happening on a regular basis and recorded the wife being sexually active and then took that recording and sold it. Uh, culture, trend, I can't tell you how many young people say, no, don't, don't over yet. Don't over yet. And that's the thing. When I go to kids now, in the first, first time I was like, you have to know about this, you have to know about that. And I realized, what am I doing? I'm trying to tell them what they need to know about. When I started talking about Snapchat, you know Snapchat? When I first started talking about Snapchat, I was still at screenshot. As in, Snapchat has a private function, it's about vanishing photographs. And it has a private function that if you send the photograph for a minimum of up to 10 seconds, you can look at it for 10 seconds and it disappears. So when we started investigating, we figured out, obviously, intuitively, that a screenshot takes a second. So even if you send it for only 10 seconds, you can capture it with a screenshot. Then Snapchat developers caught up and they said, okay, if you take a screenshot, notification goes to sender. Then was when the boy started getting creative and told me, sir, what you need is Snapsaver, because if you download Snapsaver onto your phone, all the photographs that are open automatically come and you don't have not notification, it doesn't go. Then I'm talking to the girls about that and then the girls tell me, no sir, now Snapsave has developed. Even if you have an app like that, notification goes. Then the boys told me, sir, what you need is aeroplane mode. <laughs> so I said, what is aeroplane mode, sir? Put your data off, don't open the Snapchat. Then open it once the data is off. Take your screenshot, close the Snapchat, put your data back on, open the Snapchat again. <laughs> notification doesn't go. Now Snapchat has caught up with that. But every time they try and make it safe for your photograph to vanish, which vanishes to a server which can be hacked. But anyway, the photograph that vanishes, someone finds a way through. Keeping uh, sexual attraction, signaling availability. Remember the rose and the hallmark card and the box of chocolates? Now it's a dick pic. Now it's a boob shot. And I'm not kidding you, I'm saying young as 11, young as 12. Right? I like you, dick pic. I like you, boob shot. No face, no face, no face, but it's sent on WhatsApp, you know who you're getting it from. Okay? Signaling availability. Uh, keeping the partner interested. This is the thing, right? If you don't send me a nude, why would I be in this relationship? I'm going to go. What's the point? Right? A nude, you don't trust me. You don't love me. Send me that nude. Sir, I only censor because 
He was going to go, sir. So I only sent because he came and told me, sir, all my friends had sent, all his friends, girlfriends had sent him news. I am the only one who had not sent him a news. I said, you should have asked him how he knew all his friends had got the news. Okay, this is a private contract. Consent. Trust. Right? Sir, I sent him a news every day because he told me that he doesn't want to watch porn, that watching porn is wrong. And that if I don't send him a nude, then he has to watch porn. <laughs> right? Then, data retrieval software. I'm oh, sorry, the part, the marriage, marriage, marriage. This will always stay with me and it will haunt me. 14 year old girl, I sent her the nude because we were going to get married, we were going to buy a house in Vellavatta, we were going to plant a mango tree in the back garden, we were going to get two dogs, a Labrador, and we were going to adopt a dog from Otara's program in Bach. What is her self-esteem? What is her self-respect? What is her value of self? What is her relationship with her parents? What is her relationship with her peers, her friends, her colleagues, her teammates, whoever the people are in her life, that at 14 she needs this escape to Vellavatta. What is going on there? Like I said, so low self-esteem, swoop, not new. Uh, data retrieval software. So data retrieval software, the communication shop guys love it. They love data retrieval. Why? Because when they get the phone, these guys have deleted everything, all the videos, all the pictures, they plug in the data retrieval and they suck it back. Why? Because it's not a phone, it's a computer. So this guy in Baunia told me, sir, I take every device that comes into me to be fixed. I put this data retriever. Don't know what's on it. Standard. Standard demo. When you go. So go to a place that you trust, that is reputed, that you can sue. Accidental. Boy said, sir, my girl, I asked my girlfriend for a nude. She got too smart and she sent me a nude only from the neck up. I said, okay. Then I forced her and I said, no, I want to see more from the belly up, okay. Then I said, no, that's not enough, I want a proper nude. She took a full frontal and by accident she put it on Instagram without sending it on DM. Now think about that situation. This girl is being pressurized to send more and more and more. So she gets all flustered and without putting it on direct messenger to him by mistake, she puts it up on Instagram. In 12 minutes, captured, sent to the boy, dude, your girlfriend is online, what's going on? Three weeks later when they contacted me, it is now on Facebook as part of a sex worker site saying, please call me if you want to have sex with me. Okay? Accidental. <coughs> Peer pressure, popularity. Send the nude, it's okay. I sent the nude. Have we told our kids not to give in to peer pressure? Hands up if we told our kids not to give in to peer pressure. Thank you. Hands up those who have told our kids not to peer pressure. That's probably why it's this school. Second question doesn't always get the hand going up. Because sometimes peer pressure is easy to talk about it. Don't give in. But sometimes, unlike you, they don't say it. Don't pressure your peer. Then, control, power, shame, revenge, blackmail. Yes, once that picture is out, what I can make you do with that picture? Money. Poverty, 500 rupees for a boob shot without your face, escalating all the way up to 2,500 rupees for a close-up of female genitalia. A list, a price list. Who has that price list? Where is that price list going? That price list is going into schools, international schools. I don't know about your schools. That price list is going into schools saying this is how much we are willing to pay for these images. And then of course ignorance of the consequences of our laws, which are yet to. So if you want to take a look at the pattern, this was done by a master student last year with us. She interviewed the CID, she interviewed law enforcement, she interviewed organizations working in the field, she interviewed government, she interviewed multilaterals like UNICEF. And she came up with this chart saying this is the way it works. So most often that initial victim sends to the boy for those reasons stated. The boy sends down to his close groups. So we track one to tuition, O level class, all the schools from Colombo. Then what happened? That link with 500 pictures went into all the schools, all the groups, 
the rugby WhatsApp group, the cricket WhatsApp group, the volleyball WhatsApp group, the swimming WhatsApp group, into all the society groups, all the activity groups, all the class groups. Why? Because these are kids we know. But then, that large WhatsApp groups of 500 members, that's when they started to realize the value. And then came the organizer. And this organizer is the one who is reaching out to kids in school. And the organizer is the one who is now reaching out to the girl directly. And the organizer is the one who is coming up or helping kids come up or the kids are coming up with different kinds of strategies now to meet this demand that they have created for new images and videos of people having sex. So for example, a 14 year old boy, Instagram, we've had a similar case at the school I'm told. Instagram, boy is 14, girl apparently, having a conversation with the boy. In the meantime, that girl as a standard MO finds out who the girls are in this boy's life. Does he have a sister? Does he have a mother? Does he have a cousin? Whose pictures can I target? And then tells the boy, I will send you a nude with my face if you send me a nude with your face. Boy gets excited, sends a nude with the face. Perpetrator says, right, I have this nude with your face. Now here's how it's going to go down. I want a picture of your sister. Then, boy hangs out outside the sister's bathroom with his phone and tries to take a picture of the sister. He gets one of her in underwear, sends it to the perpetrator and says, right, I've done my job. Perpetrator sends picture to sister, says, this is the picture that your brother sent me. I have more, including nudes of you that he sent me. You have to send me your nudes now, or this same standard MO. Sister goes to the father, father brings the boy and comes to meet me. And then very quickly, within the week or 10 days, two more cases of a similar MO came to us. So, next slide. If you take a look at this conversation, this is also a standard MO. The victim is in blue. I got your pictures. Not just your pictures, I have videos of you having sex. You can see the attitude now. And then you can see the request. What I want you to pay attention to is the request. What do you want me to do? Tease me for 10 minutes. What is tease me for 10 minutes? Call you a naughty boy, what is tease me for 10 minutes? So she didn't understand, so she called. She said, what do you mean tease me for 10 minutes? Put your phone on, record yourself, and do the things I tell you to do to yourself for 10 minutes, and I will delete your videos, and I will delete your photographs, and I will not, give it, I will not let them go out. That's all you need to do. Next slide. And the girl, this is another excerpt, of, this is a long conversation, this is about 10 slides, but I'm just showing you three. You know, I've done these things tons of times, and then just to prove that he, he has her, he sends her the pictures, just to prove. And then again, he's like, 10 minutes, man, 10 minutes, and sends a video, just 10 minutes, and then all this goes away. At this point, she contacts me and says, listen, this has happened to me, it was a Friday, this has happened to me, what do I do? I said, you buy time till next Thursday, and on Monday, we'll go to the CID, and we'll have a chat with the CID. And we'll try and get him before Thursday comes. Next slide. So she has this conversation with this guy. Okay? Trying to go till Thursday morning. And then he sends a video of her performing fellatio on the boyfriend and says, Listen, if you don't do what I'm going to tell you to do, I'm going to send this to your best friend's mother and then sends the best friend's mother's Facebook page. And the girl really freaked out. Because the best friend's mother is not whom she wants that going to. She would prefer it to come to her own mother rather than go to the best friend's mother. So it's very interesting that the perpetrator who claimed to be Nadum Pereira from Australia understood who her best friend is, understood who her best friend's mother is and understood the dynamics of those relationships and knew that that would best elicit this, which means that the perpetrator generally in this case knew pretty much who the girl was. And like child sexual abuse, perpetrators are often close to home. Next slide. Another strategy, this is just a regular picture. Send me nudes 
Otherwise, I'm going to take this regular picture, I'm going to edit it, take all the heads off this, make nudes if you don't send me nudes. Now, what was interesting about this school was that this school had given express instructions to its students, you cannot be online. So, of course, at a sports event, someone took a picture and put it up on Instagram. So much for that rule. But when we asked the girls about bringing the National Child Protection Authority in, coming to the school and doing a program, involving the school administration, they were like, no way. No way, you'll get expelled. So, having a supportive school helps. Next slide. This is another example of that, a university student. Same thing happened to her. A face was put on that naked image and sent to her with other naked images. And said, if you don't send me your nudes, tomorrow morning when you go to lectures, these nudes will be all, of, all over. Now the thing is, the technology is getting better and better and there's something called a deep fake now. A deep fake is basically, I can take this gentleman's face and I can find a porn star and put this gentleman's face on the porn star and I can program this gentleman's face to look like he is having sex in this video. So famous people now, their faces are being taken, put on these porn stars and then there are porn videos of these famous people acting. Okay, so it's not just a crude job of a head on a body, this is far more sophisticated. Next slide. This is an old case, next slide, which I want to highlight two things. One, grooming, and second, how this nude culture of boyfriends and girlfriends has now moved to porn. So grooming, you can see, two girls were talking, one girl was hacked into, two girls were talking, and they were like, you and women, he for she is doing a campaign, it's about taking photographs. There was no such campaign. What are the photographs? First, take a photograph of the color of your shirt, safe. Then take off your shirt and send me a photograph of it, safe. Take off your shorts and send me a photograph of it. Take off your bra and send me a photograph of it. Take off your undies and send me a photograph of it. All safe because it's photographs of pieces of clothing. Right? Then, the subject comes back into the picture. Put up, put, get into your underwear, photograph from the front, photograph from the back. Take off your underwear, put it in the bin and send me a photograph of the bin. So that grooming, slowly, getting her comfortable. Next slide. And then they go there. The word blacked out is the word that Donald Trump likes to use. Right? They go here. Now, I think you'd agree with me that this is no longer about that naked image. This is far more sexually explicit. And the reason it's sexually explicit is because now it's moved towards pornography. Next slide. And now, if you take a look at this case study, basically what happened here was that this girl got cold called. So now they're cold calling. They're checking Facebook, uh, they're checking Instagram, and they're trying to figure out, make a judgment, whether you are the kind of girl that would share news or would make videos, and then they attack you and say, listen, I have your videos, I've seen it all, I'm going to the parents, I'm going to have these conversations, and the girls freak out. And then this girl contacted me and said, this is the case. And I said, did you send it? No, I told you. I said, don't send. Don't send. I said, if he's serious, first thing is he's going to threaten you with the images and the videos. I said, where are those? And here's what transpired. The girl had those videos and images only on her phone, not even on her boyfriend's phone. Apparently what she does is, she took those images, she had made the video, but on her device, and she just shows them to the boyfriend, and she's there when the boyfriend is there, so that he doesn't share them on WhatsApp. So trust issues, right? But that was the way, she, so she was so paranoid about this. She went there, but she was paranoid, so this is how she's controlled it. So I said, at any point, could this have, no, no, at no point, maybe he had my phone and got them that way. So I said, just wait until the videos and the images come, because that's the escalation. Nothing came. Nothing came. And then we heard that this is now a strategy. 
Cold call. Cold call. Get them. Freak them out. Try and get them to share. Next slide. So in 2016 was when we first started to think this new culture is going to percolate into the porn industry and we did a small online survey. Over 800 people responded from every district in Sri Lanka except Kilinochi. And the reason it's called 800.criminals is because obviously pornography is illegal. And you notice that the top category that is being watched is Sri Lanka. The next top category that is being watched, arguably, is girlfriend and homemade. Okay? And then of course, you, if you discount your anal videos and your big tits videos, Basically, you have Sri Lankan girlfriend, the homemade, and then you have the teen. So, who are these Sri Lankan girlfriend, ho teens who are making videos at home? Our children. Children in this country. Children across this country. Or young people across this country. Let's not say children. Let's not sexualize children. Young people across this country are making these videos. Not so young people across this country are making these videos. Next slide. If you go to Lex Hamster from Sri Lanka, what do you see? You will see a little Sri Lankan flag. This is a, so if you go to Lex Hamster from India, you see an Indian flag and so on and so forth. So you see that Sri Lankan flag and you can click on that Sri Lankan flag. Next slide. If you go to Pornhub and you type in Sri Lanka, there is your drop down. Okay. So these videos are out there. But the good thing about these videos, like I said, is Pornhub, X Hamster, and other video, other porn sites like it, mainstream porn sites, will take those images and videos down if you prove that it is you and no consent. Next. But here's where it got dangerous. Like it's not dangerous enough anymore. Uh, 2017, December, we received a tip from a boy in the school saying, Sir, three of my friends in the schools in Colombo, their videos of having sex with their boyfriends are on this site, can you please block this site? So we went to this site. And for the first time I saw an exclusively Sri Lankan site. I saw images and videos that we had received over the last three years that had been uploaded onto this site. So a lot of teenagers and young people were involved in this site. Then. We started to see who blocked it, the uh, Telecom Regulation Commission had blocked it, but then we found that it keeps opening under a new URL, seamlessly. So if the porn site is exit.com, you block exit.com, tomorrow it is exit1.com. You block that day after it is exit2.com. You block that exit3.com. And the thing is, if you type in exit.com and it's now at exit25.com, it just takes you there immediately. And who is running this site? The site is registered in Macedonia and there's another site registered in Micronesia, if you know where those are. The phone numbers used to register the site are in London. So it's a very sophisticated operation. And very clear instruction on how to upload files. And now this site has developed to the point that it has an interface that looks like Pornhub. So it used to have a sort of very basic interface in terms of looking like a drop box. It had archives, but now on up videos like this, they've diversified, they have now Indian videos, Pakistani videos. And when you go to the President's office and you go to the CID and you go to the Attorney General, this is right down the priority list. Because they are looking at child pornography mostly. These are adults, they should have known what they are doing. You can see that they are doing it, you can see that they are being videoed. Child pornography is not that, there is a clear victim. So this is way down that list. Next. This category, Auntie Ladana. Aunt is having a bath. What is it? Basically voyeurism like this, you can see there is a fan light there and someone has put the phone out and is filming this poor woman taking a bath. There are cameras fixed in bathrooms, in shower cubicles. Sometimes you watch these videos, you can tell that it's somewhere where the Palmyra fences are around the well. So maybe Mannarama or Jaffna or that part of the world. Okay? And this is a very popular category on these porn sites. Along with upskirts. I think you know what upskirts are. So now, boys would drop their phones 
on the bus with the camera turned on filming up the skirt. Why? Because there's a value for that. Next. If you are in Korea, you must care to go to the bathroom. Right? Because this is how bad it's got. This is how bad it's got. There is discussion now about taking a device with you when you go to a public uh, bathroom in Korea. Can you imagine that? You are in a hurry to go to the loo and you've got to go there and scan it. Right? Before you do your business. Now, this is where we are going because this technology is not just available in Korea. You can buy these cameras pretty cheap on camera.lk. You can buy them at Liberty Plaza. You can buy them at Majestic City. You can buy them at Unity Plaza. It's there. It's cheap. Technology is getting cheaper. Next. And what is the effect that pornography has had on intimacy? What is the effect in terms of kids thinking this is what sex is, this is what it means to be intimate, this is what it means to be together, this is what it means to be with someone. What does it mean? It means that the girl has to perform fellatio on the boy. Why? Because that's generally what you first see on a porn video. So this is a piece of research that is coming out of Australia. It's called Sex Before Kissing. Right? So, this reality is not limited to Australia. This reality will emerge wherever young people think porn is sex and then we have given them no other option but to think that porn is sex. I don't know about your school but elsewhere. Right? We don't even want to say sex. The word sex was removed from the textbook when it referred to sex and gender and new terminology was added sex was replaced by biological gender and gender was replaced by social concept of gender no such thing as biological gender no such thing as social concept of gender it's just gender and sex sex determined by your by your genitalia gender determined by the social construct Simple. But no, we don't want to put sex in there. We don't want to put condom in there in case our kids go and experiment. Really, our kids are waiting to read condom in a grade 9 textbook before they go and experiment or before they hear about what a condom is. Because they have no access to information wherever, right? Unprecedented access to information. We are living in that time. We are living in a time where kids know the effects of MDMA. They know the effects of LSD. They know the effects of whether what will happen if they take any. They know the effects of what cocaine is. They know the effects of a party drug. How do they know? Because that information is online. But have we having conversations with them? Are we talking to them? Are we giving them information that balances out all that information that they get there in a scientific way, in a way that talks about the development of the human brain until the age of 25 and what drugs would do to it? Do we have those conversations? Because everybody is legalizing cannabis, even South Africa, and everybody thinks, yeah, cool, let's smoke, let's smoke all these different... Why am I talking about this? Because it's the same with sex, it's the same with drugs. We don't want to talk about those things. And so our kids can't make those decisions. We have 14% teenage pregnancy in Trinco. Next. So respect. Next. This Facebook page, School kill and hukala maramu translates crudely as let's fuck our school girls to death. That is what this Facebook page is. Now it could be that some man came up with this. But 3400 people thought this is a good Facebook page to like. What does that tell us about attitudes? Next. Next. This is a conversation between two boys. This was one of our earliest case studies which shows how girls are just being traded. I got six of us with face and nude. No one has those. Smiley face, rare photographs. If I know other Bridgetians, I'm interested in Bridgetians and Familians. I generally call this chap the Roman Catholic fetish guy. Right? What's going on? Now, I'm sure in this school we teach everyone to respect everyone and we talk about equal possibility and equal opportunity but generally in Sri Lanka the girl is here and the boy is here and the girl as a object is pretty much established we have languages like Padua, Kal uh, and all sorts of language even in Tamil, Sama, Tundu, Aitam just to 
make sure that the girl remains objectified. That's universal, really. But we are very good at it in Sri Lanka. Next. The attitude of a 14 year old girl saying, Sir, I sent him the picture because this is the reality. This is my reality. If I don't send him the picture, he's not going to love me, he's going to go away. Next. Next. So, I'll stop there. And I'm back here. I'm back here. This is where we are. And we need to come back here. And the reason we need to come back here is because we feel very strongly at the grassroots trust that anything we can do to push this would help us battle cyber exploitation and violence. Because if we are going to wait for the government to respond, then we are going to still have to wait a little while. Because cases we send the CID don't have a very high rate of turnover. Because if you send the CID a case with a fake Instagram account or a fake Facebook account, it means that you need to go to court and get a court order and then send that court order to Instagram and Facebook in order to get that information. And the CID actually prefers if you come to them and say, here, this is the person who did it, here is his phone number. They prefer those cases because then it shows that they have a higher success rate. The reason also is that if you go to a local police station and say, listen, this is happening to me on Facebook, or if you say anything about online, please go to the CID Cybercrime Unit, 5th floor, fort. So there's a bottleneck created at the CID Cybercrime Unit. So we have been recommending regional units, non-judgmental approaches, so that when the victim comes in, we don't ask the victim, why did you send that picture? What is wrong with you? Don't you have better sense? Because those were conversations that we heard police officers having with victims. So there's a lot of work to do. We are working with the women and children's desks at the moment to put in place a manual so that when a case comes, you don't just shunt it off to the CID Cyber Crime Division. You use our existing laws. Next slide. Our existing laws. Penal code laws. Right? Obscene publication. If you, even if you share an image on WhatsApp, obscene publication. Sexual harassment. Extortion. Like the case for 75,000, you do that. Extortion. Section 372. We have the laws. We just need to use the laws, but we need to train our police officers to handle this. To not judge the girl, to not judge the boy who is also victimized. We say girls, girls, but boys are also victimized. We don't even talk about the gay community or the trans community. Because a lot of this is so underground, it's underground there, it's in that community too. And what? The gay man walks into the police station and says what? The trans girl walks into the police station and says what in Sri Lanka? Any questions? Sorry, not early morning. Uh, <laughs> they turn my computer on to see if I'm okay. I said, don't you find that creepy? She said, yeah, hence the sticking plastic. <laughs> yeah, so that technology was 2014, so imagine how that is developed now in 2019. saying no you can't do this because what we have found is when you say no you can't do this a lot of the times the kids go and do things anyway 
I'm not saying that will be okay. But I'm saying then that they start hiding stuff and then it can snowball. Because at this point, it's a YouTube channel doing what? Uh, you know, they're all into this gaming and they want to video themselves playing the game and then they put up tips on how to play the game and it's, I, I just don't know what kind of transpires from that. He's putting videos of himself up on the world so wide web. There is, there is a concern there. So if that is happening, then there could be people who see your son start chatting with him online, there is, there is, there is concern there, there are things that can happen. But I think open lines of communication between you and your son, and also you can say not yet, yeah. but how long are you going to say not yet for? So, and then I have one other question, just being a foreigner in this country, is we get stopped all the time, myself and my daughter, and people want to take photos of us. Like with them, I can't tell you how many times it's happened, please can we have a photograph? And most of the time, we're so staggered, like, okay, and the person takes a photo, and I hadn't really thought much of it until now. I mean, we should, as, so again, as foreigners, we should be like... Again, I, I'm not ready to not stand in a selfie, but we need to know what could happen. Yeah. Uh, we need to know what could be the consequence of that photograph. Yeah. We won't be doing that again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it's, also, it's also the context, right, and the feel, and the vibe you get, I mean... All those things come into play in a situation like that. What other ways are there to monitor for safety? For example, you know, boys playing these Fortnite you know, games and things like that. And then they meet other people who they chat with. I mean, boys of a similar age. But are there any sort of ways in which we can secure that or is there a way to... Any, any answers on that? Yeah, we can check that from that. <laughs> the communication that he was saying earlier is the best way on it, honestly. You, who are you playing with? Just ask them. Uh, see what they say on it. Um, the voice and video chats can get you into trouble in public gaming, because you can get into people who you don't know. I mean, I was over the weekend playing a game, and I got cursed by a kid who sounds like he's eight years old. He's like, whoa. It, it can happen. So if, if you have that open communication or you keep it to what they call a van party where it's only kids playing with kids that they know, it's always a lot more safe. It's when they get into those public games that can kind of be kind of your barrier saying, look, if you want to play this game, fine. You should only be playing with people that you know. Don't get into public gaming or no microphones. That, that can go a long way if they can play without actually hearing or being able to verbally communicate. It cuts off some of that barrier. But for how long, as he said earlier, at some point, they're going to keep asking, when can I do this, when can I do this, just because it's so popular. And as uh, she said earlier, the video game you recording yourself on YouTube playing a game is a huge, huge trend with kids uh, in the teenage years for boys. I want to ask, go back to the open lines of communication. How, um, of course I agree with you, but I want parents to have a takeaway of how, how does that you know, do you say to your kids, okay, no matter what you do, I'll always love you, or is there some sort of line we can use, or we're, we're going to talk good. about this for 48 yeah, no, hours good. before it's, it's, it's good, because open lines of communication must be established as early as possible. Uh, so it's, it's, it's not, to start now, today, uh, generally the tip I give parents is if you want to start today, say you had this, use this as the catalyst. Say you went here, you saw this, and you want to have a chat about it. So you have something very concrete then to talk about and have a discussion on. But open lines of communication from this point need to then be established and they need to grow. And most often, if you have young kids, start now. You know, At any point, you can come to me. They need to know that you have their back. I think that's the key message. However you want to give that message, that you have their back. Uh, I love you no matter what, however you want to phrase it, you have their back and that you are the point person for them in the event they fall into trouble. I think that key message, however you want to communicate it, is crucial. But also, give them an option of someone else. Try and help them identify another trusted adult too, because if you are not around, if you are traveling, for whatever reason you are not available, you pass on. <laughs> I don't know, no one wishes it, but I'm a parent now, I'm constantly thinking of, you know, what happens when I'm not around anymore, you know what I mean? So, kids need to know who they can trust. 
uh, and that conversation, if it comes from you, is very important. And another thing on consent, uh, just very quickly, because I was talking about parents, don't force your kid to kiss anyone or hug anyone or sit on anyone's lap. I'm sure you don't, but there's a culture in Sri Lanka where, you know, kiss uncle, kiss uncle, go and sit on auntie's lap, go and give this uncle a hug. And your kid is like, no, I don't want to go, and you push him. So the connection is don't teach your kid to go against his or her instincts. Rather, teach your kid that you can trust this uncle, you can trust this auntie, have those conversations. That's what I would say.